Good afternoon, chamber members. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Sabrina Binkley, head of school at Spruce Tree Montessori and chair of the Fairbanks Chamber Board of Directors. I'd like to take a moment as we do each week to thank our executive partners whose logos you saw on the screen before we began our program today. Not only are these members the backbone of the chamber's advocacy efforts, but they are the kinds of businesses that our community depends on most in both the best of times and the most challenging times. The Fairbanks Chamber is so appreciative of their partnership and so support no matter what the season is. A full list of our executive partners can be found on our website. We would also like to give a special thank you to Denali State Bank for sponsoring today's presentation. We are so grateful for the continued support of our member businesses who help us make these weekly presentations possible. We will hear from them a little later in our program today. And now I'll go to Brenna online to help us recognize our new and renewing members. Brenna? Thank you, Sabrina. We would like to thank our renewing members, City of Fairbanks, Independent Rental, Brentag Pacific, Yukon Farms, United Service Organizations, Tamara Randolph State Farm, and Arctic Sun Virtual Reality. Thank you for your renewing your membership. We're very appreciative. And today's member minute focuses on what we're doing to make sure that we are staying healthy and active. So we're seeing a lot of businesses go online to operate doing you know normal run of the day stuff and also to sell products and keep their business going. Today I want to encourage you to get outside. This week is also known as cleanup week. So if you have an opportunity to go out with your team or volunteers, we recommend you get outside, get a little fresh air, stretch your legs and help us clean up Fairbanks and North Pole this week. Back to you, Sabrina. Excellent. Thank you, Brenna. Last week, the Fairbanks Chamber sent a letter supporting the ConocoPhillips supplement to the draft EIS for their proposed Willow project. We're proud of the work ConocoPhillips did with stakeholders to amend the preferred transfer option three to address the concerns from North Slope communities and decrease the environmental impacts and concerns that will protect the subsistence way of life in the region. We we're also pleased to see the BLM adopt an adjusted public comment process that worked at a time when in-person meetings were not possible. They serve their audience and their mission in light of the pandemic, and we wanted to share our praise for their efforts that produced a most robust comment period. Our Government Relations Committee met this morning and reviewed updates on the Legislative Budget and Audit Committee and reviewed what elected positions will be open in this year's election cycle at the federal, state, and local levels as we look to evaluate what our Chamber Political Forum schedule might look like. As we seek to maintain our connection with our chamber community through these challenging times, this week's reflective prompt is based on a quote that spoke to me late last week as I prepped for my Friday staff meeting. As many of us ready ourselves to reopen responsibly, I realize the necessity for all on my team to feel a part of the process. Maria Montessori said, joy, feeling one's own value, being appreciated and loved by others, and feeling useful and capable of production are all factors of enormous value for the human soul. As we embrace the opportunities that have come through these challenging times and those that will come in upcoming months, acknowledging your own value and that of others in your organization will undoubtedly feed our souls for success. And with that, I'll go to Marissa for her president and CEO report. Thank you so much, Sabrina. I have a handful of announcements that I'd like to share with our group today. Um, first, this week, our Education and Workforce Development Committee will be meeting to discuss childcare in the times of COVID-19. Childcare in our community was already a struggle pre-pandemic, and we'll be hearing from one of our community's larger providers to hear about the challenges presented to their industry that affect all working parents that can or will shortly be returning to their workplace. Later in the week, our Transportation and Infrastructure Committee will also be meeting and they'll be hearing, uh, learning about the road and rail plan for Fairbanks. Uh, on the event side, we have a couple of membership events this week. Uh, we'll be holding them virtually. So tomorrow, we'll be hosting our second virtual Coffee Talk event that's hosted by Brenna. We'll ho we hope that you'll grab your favorite morning beverage and come and join your fellow chamber members for business-minded conversations uh, with prompts and friendly faces. You can find the event details and the participation link on our event calendar and also on our website or in yesterday's edition of The Scoop. 
Also, our membership orientation has gone virtual. Rena will be meeting with members that are either new or would like a refresher on all of the benefits provided to you by your membership with the Fairbanks Chamber. This will take place on Thursday, May 7th at 1 p.m. and you can register on our website uh, and Brenna will contact you with information and an invitation link to participate. Uh, and our final event that I wanted to talk to you about is cleanup day. So Brenna mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, it's not too late to register for this event. And this year, instead of cleanup day, we're actually turning this into cleanup week in light of our community's efforts to distance ourselves physically from one another. Uh, we can easily do that by spreading this event out over the course of seven days rather than one day. Uh, so it's not too late to register. You can register as a business, as a family, or as a neighborhood. Um, it's on our website. You can find it at fairbankschamber.org or with the Boy Scouts on their website. And then there's also a Facebook event that you can find called Cleanup Day 2020. Yellow bags are available for pickup at Green Star, the Boy Scouts office, Cowles Heating, UAF Constitution Hall, and most of your local fire stations. This year, you're encouraged to, like I said, pick up throughout the week. So we're encouraging folks to do uh, cleanup activities through Saturday, May 9th. Uh, please make sure that your group adheres to the safety information that's provided on the event pages. Uh, wear a face covering if you're cleaning in groups. Wear gloves that will protect your hands from pokes and cuts. And make sure that you maintain a distance of six feet from any members of your group that are not members of your household. Make sure that we stay, stay safe and let's get our Holden Gart Holden, <laughs> Golden Heart City in gleaming uh, condition. And then finally, uh, we have a couple of uh, business announcements in light of COVID-19 responses. Uh, for businesses that have or are looking to reopen in a limited capacity in accordance with the easing of some of our state mandates late last week, uh, you're encouraged to visit the COVID section of our website and find resources that'll help your business develop a mitigation plan and signage that you can place in your establishment that will encourage hand and face hygiene for both your staff and your customers. You can also find the business toolkit that was developed and rolled out by Foundation Health Partners a couple of weeks ago. And we wanted to share some information uh, with you that was according to some information released by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, employees and customers are looking for four primary things uh, from your business in order to gain comfort as we all move back into a more normal cycle. Uh, so the first thing they're looking for is visible hand sanitizer. The second thing is visible cleaning of high touch surfaces. The third thing is posted protocols about cleaning and san sanitation practices. And then lastly is a certificate from a health organization. And since we don't have that here in our community, I would encourage businesses to consider posting their mitigation plan uh, that is a requirement as part of your reopen strategy. That would be a great thing to post in your workplace. Uh, and then my final announcement today is that the Fairbanks Chamber, Explore Fairbanks, FEDC, and the Downtown Association are all working collaboratively in an effort to support the economic recovery process for businesses in Fairbanks. We would like you to keep your eyes peeled for a survey that we're going to be launching tomorrow and hoping that all businesses will respond in order to help us collect some great baseline information that will help us to guide our local response and efforts going forward. We understand that there's a lot of struggle and while no one has all of the answers, our organizations are collectively looking forward to being part of the solution and helping our community get back to business. You can find information about any of the events that I chatted about today on our website, as well as a host of other information. That website is fairbankschamber.org. And that's it. Back to you, Sabrina. Great. Thank you, Marissa. Now for our main, main presentation. So if you're watching this presentation live, please type your questions into the chat section and we'll share them with our presenter toward the end of his talk. The Fairbanks Chamber and our entire community were so excited to see the arrival of the F-35s to Eielson Air Force Base last week. We look forward to what that means for our economy and our relationship with our military neighbors. We couldn't be happier to have Colonel Bishop with us today to update our membership on the state of Eielson Air Force Base. Colonel Benjamin W. Bishop is the commander of the 354th Fighter Wing, Eielson Air Force Base, Alaska. He is responsible for providing realistic combat adversary training to United States and allied forces in air, space, and information operations via Red Flag Alaska, the Pacific Air Force's premier multinational large force training exercise, and through PACAF's only aggressor squadron. 
He also directs the preparation and deployment of airmen in support of global operations, enables the staging of forces through IELSEN, and integrates air component capabilities into the U.S. Car Army's I Corps through the First Air Support Operations Group. Additionally, Colonel Bishop is overseeing preparations for the arrival of the F-35A Lightning II aircraft at Eielson Air Force Base soon. Colonel Bishop entered the Air Force in May 1997 as a distinguished graduate of the Reserve Officer Training Corps at Purdue University and earned his pilot wings from Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training at Shepard Air Force Base, Texas. He is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Weapons School and has had various assignments in the United States and Europe, including operational tours in the F-15E, where he deployed in support of Operations Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, and Northern Watch. Colonel Bishop is a command pilot with over 2,500 flight hours in the F-35A, F-15E, F-16C and D, T-38, and T-37. Welcome, Colonel Bishop, and thank you so much for your service, your sacrifice, and of course, for joining us today. All right, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for everybody for joining in in this uh, kind of virtual conversation. I'm really excited to be here, and a special uh, kind of debt of gratitude to the Chamber of Commerce for you know inviting me to really talk what I'm passionate about. And uh, that's, uh, I'm passionate about airmen and families, I'm passionate about the uh, mission of the 354th Fighter Wing, and I'm passionate about how we work together with the community to support our airmen and families and also get the mission done, because we can't get it done without you. Uh, so with that, I'll go into you know, a state of the wing uh, brief that we have here, uh, and I'll start with this picture. Uh, it's kind of a title slide, but I could actually spend about two hours just talking about this picture here, because there's so much... Uh, uh, in there for for everyone to see. So I'll describe the picture that was actually taken two weeks ago today, uh, and that was during the uh, delivery of our first two F-35As uh, here at Eielson Air Force Base, which was a historic moment for the 354th Fighter Wing, for the Pacific Air Forces, and also for our uh, Alaska uh, Fairbanks community and the Fairbanks North Star Borough as a, uh, as a whole. And what you see there is a picture of airplanes, right? Um, I'll talk to the uh, the big one, kind of in the lead first, which is a KC-135 uh, tanker. Uh, that is an Allison Air Force Base aircraft that belongs to our mission partners here in the 168th Wing uh, with our Air National Guard. Uh, and it was that aircraft that our pilots flew down to Fort Worth uh, the day prior to uh, the delivery uh, and picked up the aircraft and then provided the, the uh, fuel in order to make the 3,000-mile journey uh, here to Allison Air Force Base. Uh, so that represents the partnership that we have here with our uh, Air National Guard partners in the importance of uh, uh, air refueling in order to uh, support the mission. More on that to, uh, uh, to follow in a couple of slides here. On the left wing of that tanker is two F-35 uh, Alphas, uh, so two F-35As, and those are our first two uh, uh, aircraft. And on their left wing are two F-16s. It might be kind of hard to see in the, uh, uh, the slide, but there are, those are our 18th aggressor aircraft. Those are the uh, uh, aircraft that we've been flying here. Uh, really, since 2007, we've had that uh, training mission uh, that I'll talk to uh, as well. And uh, if you go to the right wing of the uh, the tanker, you see uh, two F-22s from uh, the third wing based in Joint uh, Base uh, Elmendorf Richardson down in Anchorage. Uh, and that picture kind of shows the future of fighter aviation uh, here uh, in the Joint Pacific Alaska Range Complex, uh, which is the largest uh, uh, training range that's instrumented in the entire Department of Defense. Uh, so what we're going to see in the skies of Alaska is all those uh, aircraft training together uh, here locally, and then other aircraft coming in to participate in our training missions with Red Flag Alaska. Uh, so it is really a historic photo that you see, uh, and that was kind of the first uh, picture that we took with all those uh, assets being together, uh, and it's just the you know first step on a long road to, to follow. So that's kind of just a quick overview. Let's uh, jump into the slides and I'll talk a little bit more about kind of the mission, the strategic impact, and really how the community is supporting us through that effort. So if you go to the next slide, uh, this is a picture that some of uh, the folks in the virtual room here may have seen before, uh, but it's really how uh, airmen see the world. Uh, I always talk to any distinguished visitors that come uh, come up here. I talk about the continental United States typically has Alaska uh, put in the corner. A lot of people feel like they're going to the middle of nowhere when they come into uh, Isles and Air Force Base. But you're not in the middle of nowhere. You're actually in the middle of everywhere uh, as we look at the world. Uh, because uh, Isles and Air Force Base and Fairbanks really is in the center of all of the main uh, locations uh, that we look at in Indo-PACOM 
uh, and then also European Command. So what that means, um, what that picture shows is I can get an F-35 here, as long as I have that tanker support, I can get to really any target area in the uh, Indo-PACOM theater of operations or uh, in the European theater of operations. And that is very unique. You cannot do that from the continental East, not in the United States. You cannot achieve that global, uh, um, global reach uh, from other locations. So it's a very strategic location as you look at it from a geopolitical uh, lens. Also, what you see in this picture is no ice. Uh, so one of the things I like to highlight is we operate in the Arctic. Uh, the 354th Fighter Wing is the, the northernmost fighter wing in the entire Department of Defense. Uh, and as we look at uh, operating in Arctic operations, we have unique capability here uh, and really pioneering the future uh, of that as well. Uh, the picture of the gentleman you see there is uh, Billy Mitchell. He's one of our forefathers of the Air Force. And when he was testifying before Congress in 1935, uh, he said that Alaska is the most central place in the world for air operations because of this. He also testified that whoever holds Alaska holds the world because of that strategic reach. And so it was a very, um, a very important uh, uh, location that we have here. Uh, regarding the mission that we have in that location, if you go to the next slide, I'll just talk to that and what we do and why the 354th Fighter Wing uh, exists. Uh, and that is our mission. So if you go to the next slide, yep, our mission is to prepare U.S. and partner forces for 21st century combat and project and integrate air power in support of worldwide operations. So that prepare mission is what we've done here really since 2007 with our aggressor, aggressor mission, uh, with our red flag. And then the project and integrate is a nod to our net new combat mission that we now have with the addition of uh, two F-35 uh, squadrons to the 354th Fighter Wing. And that is a significant uh, change because what you've seen in other uh, F-35 bases, for example, Luke Air Force Base, where I was assigned previously before coming here, and also Hill Air Force Base, is they deactivated units uh, to make room for the F-35. Well, at Allison Air Force Base, we're not deactivating anything. We're just adding more to the plate because of that strategic uh, uh, impact. And then also, I'd like to mention, uh, that is a uh, picture of the cover of our uh, National Defense Strategy uh, that was published in 2018. And that was a very profound um, a document for everyone in the Department of Defense because it uh, kind of declared the environment that we're in and the fact that we are in a strategic competition with revisionist powers, um, namely Russia and China that are looking to rewrite the international order according to their values uh, as opposed to our, uh, our own. Uh, and the National Defense Strategy talks about three line of efforts. I'll highlight the first two. The first line of effort is build a more lethal force. Uh, and the second line of effort uh, is strengthen our alliances and attract new partners. By doing that, you're actually going to uh, under, uh, underwrite stability across the globe uh, and really protect our, our American way of life. And as I look at the 354th Fighter Wing, that's exactly what we do here. We create a more lethal force by training in the Joint Pacific Alaska Range Complex, and we strengthen our alliances and attract new partners with our Red Flag Alaska mission. It has strategic significance. And it's great because I can talk to anyone in my wing and I can connect them to the highest level of strategy. And likewise, anyone calling into this uh, uh, kind of the virtual room here, I connect the community to supporting that mission and that uh, national defense strategy as well, because we cannot do our mission without the support of our community. And I'll talk to more on that in just a little bit. So with that, we'll go to the, uh, kind of the next slide. And this just talks about the Red Flag Alaska exercise. And I wanted to, you know, as, as we give a state of the wing, I wanted to provide an update uh, on what that uh, uh, looks like. Uh, I like this picture because it, uh, this is one of the pictures I show to every distinguished visitor that comes in uh, uh, to include General Hyten, uh, the Vice Chairman of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, I, I gave him uh, this brief uh, earlier and it just kind of shows uh, the size of Alaska. And what I like to highlight is next to the state of uh, Ohio on that map, you see uh, our Red Flag Alaska uh, airspace. It's about the same size of uh, Ohio. And again, like I said before, it's the largest piece of uh, airspace for training uh, that we have in the entire uh, Department of Defense. Uh, and what it allows us to do is execute fifth generation tactics uh, because the ranges that we have uh, other places uh, uh, in the Department of Defense, for example, the Nellis Test and Training Range, which you may be able to um, see in uh, Nevada, uh, just isn't large enough. It doesn't provide enough real estate for us to execute those fifth generation tactics. Uh, so we do that not just for our US uh, uh, forces, but also our international forces. So currently we have two red flags scheduled for the uh, calendar year 20. Uh, the first two were canceled. So we had one scheduled for this month that we actually have been going on right now and we had one scheduled for June. But as we know, coronavirus has impacted all of us uh, to include these training exercises. So we have uh, canceled those two. Our next one is scheduled to start on 30, uh, 
uh, July uh, of this year. Uh, and we are going to invite uh, Canada, Australia, uh, and the uni United Kingdom to, uh, to participate in that uh, exercise. And then we have one scheduled for October this year as well, or South Korea and Japan is going to uh, participate as well. Uh, so what I'd like to uh, highlight is uh, as we are bringing F-35 to the skies of Alaska, we're actually making investments uh, in the Joint Pacific Al Alaska Range Complex to have better surface threats. Uh, and we've also disactivated a dedicated unit, a dedicated squadron that is managing uh, the range. Uh, which actually reflects the Air Force's interest in this equity by having a dedicated unit that that's all they do is manage the uh, 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 the J Park as we call it. And then additionally, uh, we're planning on our own F-35s on flying in those two uh, red flag exercises. I actually just gave a brief to Lieutenant General Crum, my boss, this morning uh, on our path uh, moving forward with the F-35 uh, uh, road uranium. Uh, so again, red flag Alaska has a lot of impact uh, on their strategic. Uh, stage and I'd like to highlight it. If you go to the next slide, I'll just talk to really how that mission flows into the community, specifically with the economic impact. Uh, and according to uh, our analysis of fiscal year 19, the economic impact of Allison Air Force Base is $531.1 million into the local com uh, community, uh, over uh, 2,100 jobs created, and you can see the numbers there. Uh, so it is a significant impact uh, to the community. One of the things I like to highlight is I believe when uh, Minneapolis hosted the Super Bowl a couple years ago, they got $380 million of economic uh, uh, impact into the community. So I like to say Ielson brings almost two Super Bowls uh, to the interior of Alaska in terms of uh, uh, that economic impact. And also I like to highlight this is fiscal year 19 numbers. Fiscal year 20 and 21 numbers will be even larger um, in terms of that mission growing. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, I'd like to provide a, just a little picture of represent, uh, representation of what that mission growth looks like. Uh, and this is the number of aircraft that we have here, nine uh, KC-135s with our, uh, our Air National Guard partners, 21 F-16s, and we have two F-35s currently on the, uh, on the air patch that belong to my wing. We actually have six total because Hill has, has loaned us four aircraft to help us get out of the chocks, which is great. Uh, but if you build the slide, uh, this is the next, this is the uh, representation of aircraft that will be here at the uh, end of uh, 2021. So it is a monumental increase in mission capability. And along with these aircrafts comes uh, uh, airmen and families uh, and the community is gonna have to grow accordingly to, uh, uh, to increase that impact. So uh, maybe I'm a little biased, but I don't see any other fighter wing across the Air Force that is growing like this uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, so IELTSN is very unique. It's unique with the strategic location, our impact with our mission, and then also our growth. And also I would say the unique uh, attribute we have is uh, the requirement to partner with our community to make sure that this growth happens in a sustainable manner, um, which is what I'd like to kind of uh, get into uh, moving forward. So if you go to the next slide, uh, I'll just kind of translate those aircraft into some numbers, tangible numbers for uh, in terms of people. Uh, so what you'll see here in July of 2019, that's where I like to chalk, drop the chalk line. It was a year after I assumed command of the 354th Fighter Wing and when we started uh, getting a meaningful growth in terms of population. So uh, we had 1,764 airmen. That's the top line there for a community size of about 11,300. If you build the slide, uh, what you'll see is the growth that we're getting. About 1,500 airmen uh, are being added to our active duty population, which is almost a doubling in size of the active duty. Uh, population, which means the growth for the Allison community goes to about 14,700, about 15,000 uh, uh, people. And then uh, what I always like to highlight in all the public forums is the fact that the community has really partnered with us to allow for this growth to happen in a sustainable manner. And what you see there is a picture of the regional growth plan that was published in the fall of 2018. Uh, what you see there is a uh, projection of that community growth, which is about 5% as a direct result of the uh, uh, the growth of the 3th to 4th Fighter Wing uh, mission. So if you go to the next slide, what I'd like to talk about is just some of the breakout, kind of the hot topic items. And I provided an update a year ago uh, to the chamber on some of these topics. And the first one really is the housing outlook. Um, and as we go to the next slide, I'll just kind of start talking to it. Uh, I always like to remind everyone that there's no plan within the uh, five-year defense uh, spending plan to build any new housing on Allison Air Force Base. So as we have all those new uh, airmen and families coming into uh, Allison Air Force Base, uh, we're going to have to we'll partner with the community to make sure they have the quality housing that we need. I will say I've uh, received great support uh, with the Tiger team 
uh, that the community stood up uh, well ahead of before even I arrived here to start looking at this uh, uh, issue. Uh, one of the things I always track and I actually have some slides right here uh, that are, are given to me every month in terms of tracking our own internal metrics. Uh, one of those metrics that we track is 91% occupancy rate on base uh, for our base housing. Typically, when I got here, that was about 95%, uh, but our partners in Corvius actually invited people that weren't active duty members to go find housing in the local community. So our uh, occupancy rate actually dropped into the mid 80s uh, in order to prepare for that growth uh, because we want to try to uh, ease the uh, uh, ease the growth and make it to as steady of grade as possible instead of having these large leaps. And that was one of the ways that we can control that. So we're about 91% occupied, which is exactly where I want to be. I expect we're going to probably be 95, 96, 97, 98 as we go into uh, the summer and fall. Speaking of the summer and fall, one of the things I try to do for the community as Allison Air Force uh, commander is just broadcast how much growth we have quarterly. Uh, and uh, the uh, the numbers that we have through uh, one October of this year is 306 airmen that have orders that are going to report. And then I would like to highlight that's net growth. So that is the number of airmen that are moving in subtracted from the number of airmen that are programmed to move out. Uh, so that number is 306 of, uh, of net growth. With the dependents that we have on their orders, that's going to be about 596 uh, more people moving to the community just for Isles and Air Force Base uh, through one uh, through one October. Uh, so uh, I'm also closely working with the borough in order to manage uh, and kind of keep situational awareness of the borough capacity. And right now I feel good. Uh, for example, uh, as a fourth quarter of last year, the apartment vacancy rate is, was 17.9%. So I feel like we're well postured to absorb that growth, uh, at least in the uh, initial term, uh, which, is a, which is a good news story. Uh, but it's something we, we uh, track closely. And by having that uh, good exchange of information, uh, if uh, friction areas or areas that come up uh, that need to be addressed, then I feel like we have the great, uh, the great support of the community and we have those open uh, communication channels. Uh, what I'd like to do is go to the next slide and also talk to some of the other hot topic issues that I briefed a year ago. Uh, one of those was the workforce. Uh, that's one of the uh, things I've been looking at uh, in the 354th Fighter Wing is we can have the aircraft, but if you don't have the right people to do the job, we're not going to be successful with our mission. Uh, and that includes the civilian workforce. Uh, so we have 436 civilian positions on the books right now. We're actually growing to 539 by the end of fiscal year 2021. Uh, when I showed up, the hiring time, average hiring time was 100 and, excuse me, 270 days between when a job was posted and when it was uh, filled. Right now, we've been able to cut that down to about 120 days uh, or actually 80 days if it's a direct hire position. So that's better than it was, but we're still uh, continuing to work on that. And I was actually just talking to Lieutenant General Crum about that uh, uh, as well. Um, right now we have about 20% vacancy rate and we have over 80 jobs open. So if you know anyone that's interested in looking uh, for a job and joining uh, the IELTS team, please direct them to IELTSandjobs.com uh, and we're happy to, uh, uh, to kind of take their application. One of the other hot topics was medical care. Um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, the medical uh, service is something that's in everyone's interest, particularly in specialty care and mental health care. Those are the two areas that we're looking at. And uh, I'm happy to report that uh, we have great partnership with the community uh, and our foundation health partners in order to, to articulate that demand signal and get after it. Uh, one of the, uh, I'll just share one of the things I've been looking at is how do you capture that in data? Uh, and then one of the things that uh, I've learned is we have an exceptional family member program in the uh, Air Force. We call that EFMP because we have an acronym for everything, right, in the Air Force. Uh, but EFMP is for members that have uh, active duty members that have family members that have, require special services. So either specialty care, um, uh, speech therapy, anything that's uh, different in terms of medical care, we capture that through the uh, EFMP process. Uh, in 2018, Everyone that had orders to IELTS and Air Force Base that had an EFMP uh, member, only 60% of them were approved uh, to move here, uh, which, is, which isn't good to be frank. Uh, however, uh, what I'm happy to report is in 2019, that approval rate jumped from 60% to actually 85%, uh, which is uh, really a good news story in terms of us being able to provide the services locally in order to meet the uh, the unique uh, needs of our family members. Uh, obviously, 85% is not where I would like to be. Like it to be. I would like it to be 100%. Uh, 
uh, but compared to across the Pacific Air Forces, is actually better than normal. The uh, standard approval rating for last year uh, was 81%. Um, so medical care is something I'm still very interested in, something uh, that, I, that I look to partner with the community with, but I'm encouraged even in this area uh, as well. Uh, the other area I like to highlight is schools. Uh, that is very important to uh, Air Force members and their families. Uh, the snapshot there is of our two schools, um, uh, Crawford and Ben Eilson, uh, from, that I took from uh, greatschools.org. And I actually shared this when I went out on a roadshow with uh, members down at uh, Hill Air Force Base and uh, Salt Lake City and Luke Air Force Base outside of Phoenix. I was able to show this uh, slide. So I'm really interested as we continue to grow that we're able to hire the teachers to maintain that quality of education. Uh, for IELTS and Air Force Base and obviously for our interior uh, community. Uh, the other area that I want to highlight, it's not on the slide, but really moves. Uh, so uh, coronavirus, like I mentioned earlier, has impacted everyone. Uh, and some of you may be aware that the Department of Defense put a stop movement order on all uh, permit changes of station or PCSs effective 30 June. One of the things I'm really interested in partnering with the community is in that move industry. Uh, if everyone tries to move in the month of July, we're going to overwhelm the system. Uh, so I'm really interested in if anyone in the movement uh, industry knows what our capacity is in order to accommodate all those airmen uh, coming in, but not just airmen, think of soldiers as well going to Fort Wainwright. How do we work as a part, uh, uh, through a partnership to, to make sure we don't overwhelm that uh, capacity? And if there's anything from the installation perspective on a, kind of spreading those moves across the, uh, the time frame, uh, I'd really be interested in uh, kind of thoughts. Uh, and that's something that uh, Lieutenant General Crumb is looking at uh, as well. So those are kind of the uh, the bottom line is, as we grow, again, it kind of links back to uh, uh, my uh, uh, my earlier remarks in terms of the community support that you see on this slide is essential for us getting after uh, uh, after the mission. Speaking of getting after the mission, I've also, if you go to the next slide, also got a lot of questions about how we're operating in the coronavirus environment. Uh, what I'm happy to report is that we are still flying and operating. That's one of the things that we do in the Department of Defense is we do hard, right? Uh, we are used to operating in a contested environment. We need to be able to do that. And coronavirus is just another uh, example of that uh, uh, contested environment. Uh, so we are linked uh, with our public health uh, partnerships. My priorities through coronavirus are one, safeguard our airmen and the families, two, safeguard our mission, short term and long term, and then three, support our community as a whole. And we do that with great uh, communication with our public health team and the local community information. Uh, so we are getting after the mission. Uh, this is a picture of two of our F-35 pilots stepping to fly wearing their face masks. You might be able to not be able to see it, but there's actually little F-35s uh, uh, embroidered in, the, uh, in those face masks. And we're using social distancing, cloth masks, and hygienic procedures to ensure the mission continues. And what I'd like to highlight there is that picture on the right uh, isn't the first landing. That's actually the first takeoff. Uh, that we had in, uh, of an F-35 out of Allison Air Force Base. I actually watched that takeoff personally, uh, and I will say it was actually more of an emotional event seeing the first takeoff than the first arrival, uh, because that is why we're here. That's why I was hired for this job, is not just accept aircraft, but get the mission started and get in the training mission. And I'm happy to report that that happened. Uh, within 72 hours of receiving our first aircraft, we are training in the skies of Alaska. And this week is the first week we have F-35 scheduled every day on the schedule. Um, so for me, I've been associated for the F-35 program since really 2009. That is a monumental leap in capability and just shows the maturity of that. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is where we're going moving forward. Uh, you can actually build the slide out, if you will. It just shows our red flag mission. We're adding the F-35 mission and we're gonna uh, achieve the strategic impact uh, and if you build it one more time, you'll see it actually to the nth scale. Uh, so it's actually difficult for me to actually quantify and describe the strategic impact that we'll have on, uh, with the 354th Fighter Wing uh, here at Allison Air Force Base, but it is going to be uh, immense. And again, we cannot get that mission done without your support. So I couldn't be more, uh, uh, be, I guess, more thankful uh, for your help in that. If you go to the next slide, again, these are just more pictures that were taken two weeks ago. Uh, this is a picture of uh, our uh, second F-35 that actually landed. It was the F-35 that uh, we went down. Uh, I traveled down with my group commanders and some community leaders to actually see this aircraft uh, on the line. Um, I was actually had the privilege of signing. So my name's actually on that airplane. We have some community leaders and our congressional delegation actually signed uh, uh, that as well. But that is a symbolic representation, again, of the community coming together uh, to be able to make the mission happen in the 354th Fighter Wing. Uh, 
So our motto is Valor in Combat. Uh, we have that combat mission uh, again, and I'm excited to see how we're going to work, uh, move forward as a, a wing, uh, partnering with our community uh, to make uh, great things happen in the future. So with that, I think that's uh, my last slide. I'll kind of, kind of pause here and see uh, what questions uh, we have from the crowd. Okay, thank you so much, Colonel. Uh, so yes, so we'll now take questions from the community live via the online chat, but I'll go ahead and start. I have a question. You know, I imagine with the arrival of new airmen will come the arrival of qualified spouses as well. Can you share with our chamber business community how we might reach out to you with our own job openings? Yes, absolutely. So that's one of the uh, uh, two items that at the, at the Air Force level uh, that we look at in terms of future basing decisions, I alluded to one of them, education. Number two is actually spousal employment opportunities. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, uh, well-qualified spouses. I will say selfishly, that's one of the demographic I'm reaching out for our own internal Allison Air Force Base uh, jobs. We're, we're sending them the uh, uh, allisonjobs.com. But absolutely, if, it, um, if there's a way to kind of consolidate job opportunities it's particularly in the, uh, the health uh, industry and the education industry, uh, those are, uh, we have a lot of spouses that uh, operate in those industries just because they're so mobile, right? Um, but uh, anything that we can do to, uh, as a community, to make it easier for our spouses to find employment in the interior of Alaska will help uh, the 354th Fighter Wing mission uh, to include reciprocity uh, agreements uh, for professional certifications and, and such. Great, thank you. Well, now we'll go to Janelle and she will moderate the questions for you that come in online. Thank you. Um, so the first question that's come in is just actually kind of a personal question. So what's next for you, Colonel Bishop? So I'm glad you asked the question. Um, for me, uh, it's actually, this is a bittersweet moment uh, because seeing the picture, you actually actually see those two F-35s. That's why I was hired, right? Uh, to, to come in here and uh, bed down F-35s and get that process started. Um, I'm actually leaving in two weeks. Uh, so I have been assigned to work for the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the Joint Staff uh, down in the Pentagon. Uh, and I have orders to report no later than uh, 30 May. Uh, so I'm actually going to pack up uh, and, and leave here. Uh, so again, it's a bittersweet because I don't want to leave this job. Uh, I don't want to leave uh, Alaska. Uh, Aaron and I have really, um, I guess it's really an emotional tie to, uh, uh, to this community and to the location. Uh, I love raising my children here. Um, I think I'm going to leave my heart uh, in Fairbanks, uh, in the golden heart of Alaska. Uh, and I suspect we're probably going to be back uh, in the future, uh, at least a visit, uh, maybe even longer, uh, longer term. So um, I will say that is, you know, uh, my assignment is actually a good, it's a good thing for, for my career progression, but it like represents really the, the, uh, um, the achievements the 354th Fighter Wing team has, uh, has made uh, through these last uh, 22 months. Sounds good. Um, and I think that you've been very thorough today because we actually have no more questions that have come in yet, but I know that Marissa did say that she had a comment to share. Thank you for that, Janelle. Um, I just actually wanted to thank Colonel Bishop. Uh, it, it, as is the case typically with people in your role, you haven't been here uh, for very long, but it certainly doesn't feel that way. We've had so many great opportunities to connect with you. Um, you have been ex extraordinarily generous with your time back to the chamber. Uh, so things that not everyone would know about is uh, Colonel Bishop has actually came and, and he spoke to our leadership Fairbanks group. Um, earlier uh, in their in their year, which is actually last fall, um, and that remains to be one of the the favorite sessions uh, that folks in that program um, attended. And so, thank you so much for sharing your time. Um, but between Colonel Bishop and his entire team out at um, Ielsen Air Force Base, the relationship between the Chamber and Ielsen has never been stronger. I don't think. Um, and I just really appreciate your leadership and uh, the way that we've been able to forge those relationships. Everything from going out to the air show last summer and selling rubber duck tickets uh, to being a part of the um, honorary commander program and just all of these great opportunities to work with you. Uh, you will definitely leave a hole in Fairbanks and as is the case, uh, you're always welcome to come back and retire here in your future like so many other 
uh, past military uh, folks have a, a habit of doing. So thank you so much from all of us at the chamber. Thank you, Marissa. And again, it's a privilege to serve in this capacity and really be able to contribute to the larger community. Um, I will just say my, my replacement is uh, going to be Colonel Anger in the short term, uh, the Vice Wing Commander, and the permanent replacement is Colonel David Birkeland, who is a fantastic leader, and he's going to do even better things for the 334th Fighter Wing and the, the community relationship. He's actually a close personal friend. We were roommates back in pilot training back in 1998, uh, so he's going to be a uh, uh, a great leader for the, the wing moving forward. But again, I'm leaving a piece of my heart here uh, and I look forward to seeing everyone again uh, uh, soon. And actually a question did come in uh, on that note of your successor um, since since I was with you last. Um, so someone asked, since your mission was betting down the three F-35s, what is the mission of your successor? Is there something specific that they're here to work on? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Colonel Birkeland is going to go through a F-35 transition course before he shows up here. So he'll be flying the F-35 and it's his job. We did the bed down. It's going to be his job to finish the bed down and really bring the F-35 uh, along the road to combat readiness. Uh, so we're, we've actually laid out a plan that uh, uh, Colonel Birkeland is going to execute in terms of the road to readiness, initial combat capability, and then also full combat capability uh, for uh, the 354th fighter wing and what's neat about full combat capability of the f-35 here at allison that'll be two 24 uh, aircraft uh, combat squadrons 54 actually aircraft total on the installation uh, but what's going to be unique about that full combat capability is actually going to inform uh, an air force level programmatic decision to declare the f-35 program as a whole uh, fully operationally capable we call that foc so that's actually a very, that's a major programmatic milestone uh, that uh, we are supporting. So the F-35 is important, not just to IELTSEN and PACAF, but also to Air Combat Command and the entire Air Force, uh, because the Air Force needs us to succeed to be able to make that happen. And that's really gonna be Colonel Birkeland's job, in my opinion. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Um, another question did come in, and this is actually one that we've had a lot of communication about in the community lately. Uh, do you, feel confident that there will be enough housing for your incoming folks who, uh, who are going to be joining us, particularly in the North Pole area in the near future. Yes, housing is something, again, I'm very interested about. Uh, I use the term concern because that's something that we spend attention just tracking. Uh, but the data that I have presented to me now from my team and from the, the borough is I'm comfortable. I feel like we're postured well uh, going into the summer. Uh, in terms of like long term, I think it's going to be important for us to communi communicate the dialogue to make sure that the um, demand equals the supply. Uh, I will kind of go on a little bit of a tangent. One of the things that uh, I um, researched before coming up here are some other communities, specifically Clovis, New Mexico. That's uh, Cannon Air Force Base is located there. And when Cl Clovis, New Mexico uh, went through similar growth, uh, Cannon Air Force Base hosted Air Force uh, Special Operations Command, a wing there, which resulted in a lot of growth. And there, there was actually no, no community growth plan, really no communication uh, with the community. And what that resulted is there was a housing shortage in the initial growth that resulted in housing prices to spike, which brought in a lot of speculative investment, which re resulted in overbuilding. Uh, and then the housing, mar housing market actually collapsed. Uh, so uh, I am interested in not having that happen here. Uh, so I don't want too too much uh, housing. I don't want too little housing because that's not good for our airmen and families, and it's not good for the community. So what I'm what I'm seeing right now from my assessment is we're actually on that line of growth uh, is meeting demand. We have some extra surplus right now, but we need that uh, because, like I said, we're going through uh, a, a lot of growth here through the summer and into the uh, into the fall and winter time frame. Right. I think that's reassuring to a lot of folks because, like I said, there have been a lot of questions about that uh, recently. And that's all the questions that have come in. Most of the remaining comments are just um, messages of thanks for this presentation and for your work here in the in the community and just wishing you the, all the best. Excellent. Thank you, Janelle. And I echo Marissa's comments, Colonel Bishop, for your support of not only our chamber, but of the community as a whole. Um, we'll look forward to watching your work as you continue your journey at the Pentagon next month. So good luck to you. 
So I'd now like to welcome current board member and past board chair, um, great mentor, Steve Lundgren of Denali State Bank to present their sponsor spotlight today. Hi, Steve. Hello, Sabrina. Thank you very much. And uh, Ben, thank you so much for addressing the Chamber of Commerce today. Thanks for all you've done for IELTS and Air Force Base and the Fairbanks community. You got to town, you jumped in with both feet. Uh, we all know you. It's going to be odd to travel to IELTS and Air Force Base and think of you not being there. So the very best of luck to you and Aaron. And uh, I hope for those of us who are fortunate enough to travel back to Washington, D.C., that uh, we'll have opportunity to, to see you from time to time. And I'm looking forward to following your future and see where you end up going from IELTS. And I think uh, you've got a bright future. I actually uh, hope you end up back in Alaska, maybe down uh, at uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base uh, with a couple stars on your shoulder. So we're gonna track you, Ben, thanks a lot. Um, so um, I'm proud to sponsor the program today. Uh, always proud to sponsor a chamber program, particularly when Colonel Bishop is, uh, is presenting. It's a, certainly a, an exciting time for IELTS and Air Force Base. I look forward to the air show next year. Uh, hopefully we'll see a flight line of, of F-35s out there. Uh, in the limited time I have, I'd like to switch uh, my comments to banking. For those of you I don't know, I'm the president and CEO of Denali State Bank. I have been for 10 years. We're a hometown bank that's been here over 40 years. And I thought you might be interested in a real brief uh, PPP, Paycheck Protection Program, update. So you may know that Congress approved $349 billion in funding that began April the 3rd. That funding was exhausted after 14 days. They then approved another round of funding of $320 billion, uh, effective April the 27th. And as of Monday, $175 billion of that has been funded. So far, over 5,000 lenders have participated and granted nearly 4 million loans. Here at Denali State Bank, we're pleased to report that we've approved over 416 loans at over four at over 40 million dollars all of our qualified applicants at denali state bank have been approved and we appreciate the opportunity and are glad to help our interior alaska small businesses i miss our weekly chamber of commerce luncheons and i look forward to resuming those when it's safe to do so thank you sabrina thanks marissa and our chamber staff and that's all I have. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to Denali State Bank for your, your always continued and, and uh, solid support of our Fairbanks Chamber's advocacy efforts. Uh, so those of you that might have normally attended our luncheon and or purchased 50-50 tickets, it's Takeout Tuesday and doubly special because it's also Cinco de Mayo. So I might suggest that you take that money and spend it with a local business uh, today, ordering takeout for dinner or donate it to a nonprofit that's providing critical and basic needs during these challenging times. Uh, we so appreciate your continued participation and look forward to interacting with you next week when we'll have Ben Stevens here to present the path to reopen, reopening Alaska's economy. Uh, hot topic right now. So please stay tuned to our website and twice weekly newsletter, The Scoop, for information on our presentations and any updates we may have. Thank you so much, Fairbanks. Be well.